Good evening, Constantin. So we'll go live in a few seconds. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the KPPC, the Kuwait Public uh, Policy Lecture Series flagship program. Uh, this is our last uh, lecture series for the year 2020. And today we have a very special guest um, that will be talking on transformative innovations in mobility. Our guest for tonight is Constantin Dimitrio. So a quick background on Constantin. Uh, Constantin is a leading technology investor and startup board advisor. Currently, Constantin is head of global business development for Heart Hyperloop. He advises Cornell University, Cornell Tech Program. He's a mentor at Oxford University in the UK, uh, Delphit University, Netherlands, and is a board member of two startups in the US. Before this, he was a senior advisor to SABIC of KSA, responsible for investments and running SABIC's global incubation efforts. He was managing director for innovation development Oman, part of Oman Investments Authority. In Europe, he has set up one of the largest deep tech funds in Europe, focused on US and European investments. Over the past 10 years, he led the boards of 15 different companies across Europe and the US. He started his career at JP Morgan and Lehman Brothers in New York and London. Constantin graduated with an MBA from the Johnson School of Cornell University with a master's in international economics and law from Cambridge University. Good evening, Constantin, and the floor is yours for tonight's lecture series from the KPPC. Good evening, Faris. Uh, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is an honor to be uh, presenting in front of you today. Uh, I will share my screen and let me see. So hopefully you can all see the, uh, the screen. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was the very deep transformation taking place in mobility uh, that we, we are beginning to see right now, but it will be even more profound over the next 10 and 20 years. It is difficult to foresee this right now uh, in our COVID times, but the estimates, the long-term estimates that the OECD has for uh, cargo and passenger tra transport is that it will triple between 2020, and these are, these are pre-COVID figures, to 2050. Uh, the, the, the latest adjustments to uh, such estimates would imply that there is a, a shortfall in the next three years until things go back, but the long-term term is likely to, to stay. And there is a very large effect on climate change of all of this transportation. The G20 Global Infrastructure Outlook has estimated that over 100 trillion euros will be required by 2050, to a large extent driven by uh, the aim to reduce CO2. And there is therefore a very steep demand on behalf of governments, uh, consumers, and the public for infrastructure that is future-proof. Future-proof meaning not only in terms of the costs of an infrastructure, the energy consumption, but also its effect on climate. And if we look at new mobility in connection with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, we can identify five that are the most relevant. Affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. Uh, the one that is, has the deepest impact is the drive to create zero emission infrastructure. That affects three of the sustainable development goals of the five that I mentioned. Now, new mobility does add employment, does create investments and in infrastructure, and does create economic benefits. And therefore, that leads to uh, improvements in the sustainable development goal relating to work and economic growth. And the fact that this, this new mobility is very innovative, does involve uh, investments in R&D and patents, uh, will contribute to uh, the fifth sustainable development goal. 
Now, I, I will try and give some numbers based on analysis that, that has been done uh, in relation to Hyperloop. Uh, but the other uh, mobility uh, platforms uh, will have similar analysis done for them. And I will try to address each of the, uh, the innovations, specifically the innovations that are most relevant to new mobility are Hyperloop, uh, UAVs, uh, hydrogen, and a kind of an overarching um, development that is taking place, and that is um, mobility data. So if we look at the total addressable market, we, we look at the market data from Eurostat and US Bureau of Statistics, uh, then for, again, to come up to figures for Hyperloop, we look at the serviceable available market, i.e. specifically relevant to a mode of transport such as Hyperloop, uh, and that is the suitability criterion. Then there is a modal shift criterion. And the modal shift is actually quite a challenging concept because it implies that for new infrastructure, you build the infrastructure and you have a shift in patterns, for example, moving from aircraft to Hyperloop. Uh, that is challenging and I'll come to that challenge a little bit later, but nevertheless, in terms of numbers, we have a serviceable obtainable number and that is the number that then is included as volumes in the analysis. And based on the numbers that uh, we, we have crunched, that Hyperloop as one of the technologies has potential to save 520 megatons of CO2 annually in 2050. Um, now, there is a very large effect for uh, a technology such as Hyperloop as, 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 as much as the network grows. In other words, the, the network effect is actually very important. Uh, and the network effect actually does, uh, is, is relevant for all forms of mobility. Take an example, the, the overarching figure of 520 megatons of CO2, a Dutch Hyperloop network will lead to 12 million tons of CO2 emission benefits in, in 2050. Again, the individual uh, route will have benefits, but it, it, it becomes a multiplier effect when you have a, a network. Uh, now, th there are a number of assumptions for this because all of these technologies are proven to an extent. So they have not been fully proven. There is yet no operational Hyperloop. There is no operational um, UAV transport that is used on, a, on an active uh, basis, and there is no operational hydrogen plane as an example. Uh, but nevertheless, th this is where Hyperloop and other forms of transport are moving. The benefit for a Hyperloop network is an annual 2.1 gigaton CO2 of savings from 2050 onwards. And if we look a little bit in, in more detail, the actual benefit is primarily on replacing short haul flights, cargo trucks, and passenger cars for long distance. And this is actually going to be quite interesting because this seems to be the area where a lot of the innovation is taking place. Uh, hydrogen planes uh, are primarily now focused on short haul flights, UAVs, are short haul and ultra short haul. Uh, and that is, that is now becoming a, a very competitive space. Uh, now for, for this analysis, there was an, an assumption that 40 years would be required to build a network. Um, it does take into account an annual improvement of existing technologies, because we, we, we do understand that rail and road traffic and aviation will become more efficient over time. Um, now, there's obviously a number of Hyperloop companies and to, to, to be fair, each of those Hyperloop companies is unique. Uh, they have their own unique go-to-market strategy. Uh, what unites them is the concept of Hyperloop in the sense that Hyperloop is a pipeline. It has a low pressure environment and uses magnetic levitation. That's an open source technology originally developed by Siemens. Now, each of the, the companies has a slight focus in terms of the majority of them, for example, are focused on passenger transport. Uh, there is one company that's focused more on cargo transport. Uh, they operate in different uh, geographies. 
but nevertheless, each of them is unique and are, are doing a, a, a great job of, of developing Hyperloop. Nevertheless, Hyperloop isn't the only uh, mobility that is important to take into account. And I think it is, it is important to, to, to give credit to a number of other technologies that are being developed. Uh, one of the most interesting ones is hydrogen. And hydrogen is being pursued not only by startups, but also by some of the existing large players. And there are obviously the two large players. Airbus has been very public about its uh, commitment to developing hydrogen. Um, and they are, they are beginning to test a platform for hydrogen, not only that will involve potentially a different shape of the airplane, but also to use hydrogen as, as, a, as a method uh, to replace the engines. Uh, interestingly, the focus again is the short haul flights, a single aisle short haul flight replacement. Now, the challenges for hydrogen is that it, it is not yet feasible to pursue the longer term flights. So it, it, it seems to be likely that um, short haul flights will be the focus. And that is already a very competitive space. As I mentioned in Hyperloop, that, was, uh, that, that is going to be a key focus. Um, in fact, you have already for short haul flight, you have already high speed rail that exists in many countries, as well as normal rail and car journeys. Uh, and hydrogen does have a safety issue that is being addressed, but nevertheless, it does exist in the public domain. It is a issue that occurred in the early part of the 20th century when hydrogen was being actively used, that there is a certain safety uh, factor that needs to be addressed. If we move, move to UAVs, um, the, the potential there is to have ultra short haul uh, flights. Uh, we, we're talking essentially less than an hour. And what this would involve is that it would replace a large number of the short haul airline flights uh, just because it would be a lot more convenient. Uh, but it would involve also creating a new infrastructure. The new infrastructure is mini airports. Um, and I should make a, make a note here that both Hyperloop and uh, hydrogen planes involve some new infrastructure. Hyperloop would involve complete new, new infrastructure. So you need to lay the pipelines. You need to establish the stations. Uh, in hydrogen, the assumption is that you will be able to use some of the existing airport infrastructure, but you need ch different charging. And UAVs will need to re reuse completely different uh, locations. Nevertheless, some of this may, may be relatively easy. You can put it on high-rise buildings. You can put them in ports. Uh, you can put them even in existing airports. Now, I've, I've tried to address a little bit of what's happening in uh, passenger mobility, but it is important to see cargo mobility as being important. And this is especially so in, in COVID, because what, what we've seen over the last uh, year, as uh, passenger transport has essentially, in some cases, stopped or reduced substantially, cargo transport has not been affected as much. And in fact, if you talk to some of the ports, in some of those locations, the, the volume of transshipment through ports has increased. So in fact, the, uh, the necessity for, for innovations in cargo transport has gone up. Um, and the two major ones are using a different form of uh, propulsion in ships. Now, that, uh, th th there is uh, work taking place on using hydrogen powered ships but as well as uh, using batteries. Uh, and you have startups that are working in the space, but also a number of the large shipping companies like Maersk uh, doing that. Then you have also the potential for cargo UAVs. Now, the, the, the relevance for that is for delivery of packages uh, over a distance that at the moment is a few kilometers, but there are a number of companies aiming to develop technologies within the next five years to transport at least 100 kilograms over 100 kilometers, which would mean uh, quite a number of 
parcels can be shipped and other perishable goods over, over the air. And to, to cap it all, it is very important to pay attention a little bit to what's happening on, on data. And I've, I've given an example of a, a very innovative European company that is um, focusing on data. And you have mobile application data, you have vehicle data, you have data that's coming from the manufacturers, traffic, road quality, and weather data. And because for, 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 for most of us who are not dealing with mobility data on a day-to-day -day basis, it is difficult to, to kind of take this for granted. But this is the volume of data that is now being used to analyze uh, potential, not only potential routes for existing modalities, but also future modalities. Uh, this, this data is being now used by insurance companies, EVs, funds, uh, a large number of, of players. And this, this, the importance is data will help drive decision-making. Now, if we look at mobility challenges and where the future could potentially lie, so the challenges for any of this mobility uh, are manifold, but I've, I've tried to focus on a few of them. One of them is safety. So when you have a new mobility, you have safety considerations. Uh, and the safety is now being analyzed, especially carefully, because even existing methods of transport have had their failures. And the, the, the case of the uh, Boeing 737 MAX is, is an example where proven technology a very well-known manufacturer with very stringent conditions, nevertheless had a number of problems. Uh, you have another challenge that is what is called interoperability. And that essentially means when you incorporate a new method of transport, you need to make sure that it can be used um, interchangeably. And what, what do I mean by that? Let's say you have a Hyperloop or a UAV you need to have a station. Now the station needs to be a station where you can change from one method of transport to another. Um, and in fact, you might have new uh, mobility chains taking place. So for example, you could have a hyperloop that transports cargo over longer distance, let's say 200 kilometers, but the last mile is done by electric truck. Nevertheless, designing that interoperability is very important. Developing of standards. Now, this actually does relate to safety to an extent, but it also relates to the fact that you have a number of companies working in that space. Take the example of Hyperloop. Each company is developing its own technology, even though it's based on principles that are the same. And what we can see is the EU and the US have a certain level of coordination or discussion even, it would be more correct to call it discussion, but standards are set separately. So take the example of Hyperloop again. There is a group established in Europe that is aiming to develop a standard for cargo and passenger Hyperloop within the next three years. Uh, the US is taking its own standards approach. The, the bodies doing that are having a discussion, but they will determine the standards based on their own considerations. And bearing in mind where we are politically, I think that in the future, there will be a potential for even competition between the standards being set by EU, US, and China. Um, there is also the, the matter of existing infrastructure. And this is actually one of the biggest challenges for new mobility, because when you create a new mobility, you have the cost of the new infrastructure, but you also need to decide, especially in countries like Europe and the US, less so um, in, in other locations where the population is growing quickly, or in some cases you don't have a lot of the, 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 the legacy infrastructure, it is expensive to decommission, but also expensive to maintain. And the example is, for example, uh, new railway lines being built in Europe or high-speed railway lines. Once they are built, it will be more difficult for any government to say, well, I will also build a Hyperloop or I will also build a lot of UAV facilities next to it. So it, it will almost likely mean that um, the new mobilities will be done on a public-private partnership level with a certain level of private investment. 
Now, looking into 2040, um, in passenger travel, it is very likely that you will have a, a wider mobility mix that will include UAVs, Hyperloop, hydrogen planes, electric and hydrogen cars. And the biggest disruption is in the, I've called it less than three hour flight mobility, but like, most likely in the less than two hour flight mobility, because that seems to be the most competitive space. Beyond three hours, it, it is likely to maintain that aircraft will have the, the advantage. The existing mob mobility methods, trains, high-speed trains, long distance car travel will still be there, but with a smaller role. Uh, and there will be new hubs. So there, those could be mini airports, UAVs, but also larger hubs that could be combination of airport, rail terminal, and hyperloop terminal. For cargo transport, um, we, I, I, it, it, is, it is likely that truck transport will be completely remained in terms of removing the driver and having autonomous driving with a certain electricity or hydrogen power plant. And the short haul will be focused on vans and cargo UAVs. Uh, long haul, the most likely disruptor could be Hyperloop for cargo uh, and other pipeline-based transport because you don't necessarily need uh, a low pressure environment to transport cargo in a, in a, in a pipeline. And underlining all of this is obviously the importance of mobility data in, in determining the, the mobility mix. The, the potential for, for a, a dynamic country like Kuwait is obviously to focus on some of these disruptive technologies from both uh, an investment and implementation standpoint, potentially even forming a center in Kuwait that could utilize some of the best in class technologies and also forming maybe an R&D and implementation center, not only for Kuwait, but for the wider region, but based in Kuwait. Uh, and with that, this, this is what I wanted to, to mention in my speech. I did want to leave the floor to questions. Uh, and uh, again, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you, Konstantin, for the beautiful presentation on transformative uh, innovations with regards to mobility. We have one question from Mr. Ahmed. How will Hyperloop technology affect job creation? And will existent rail employees be easily transfer, transferred to working on Hyperloop technologies? Thank you, that, that's an excellent question. Thank you, thank you, Faris. So I think that the job creation uh, potential for Hyperloop is in a number of areas. So first Hyperloop needs to be built. So a lot of the, the, the vast majority, between 50 and 80%, will be construction-related jobs while the construction is taking place. Now, each company has a different approach to how Hyperloop will be managed, but nevertheless, I think the standard assumption needs to be that a company, a uh, locally registered company, will need to be set up. So there will be also employees of that company managing not only the maintenance, but also running the commercial functions of that company. Now, there will be also supply, supply of pipelines, supply of some of the technical equipment. That supply will need to require manufacturing. And that manufacturing, to a large extent, can be done um, locally as well. So the potential for job creation of Hyperloop is very high on the construction stage and the technology supply. Hyperloop as a system is actually low maintenance in terms of people who need to operate it because it does assume that it will be fairly automatic as, as, as much as possible. So in terms of jobs to, to, to run it, there will be a number of very high level jobs, but not a lot of um, kind of repair jobs, so to speak. The stations, those could have quite a number of jobs in relation to retail, in relation to cleaning, et cetera. Now, a shift from rail to Hyperloop, uh, one has to take into account, I guess, maintenance, station, and operation. So maintenance, the systems are different. 
you know, rail uses uh, existing engine technology, uses tracks. So in fact, those jobs could be relatively difficult to transfer over to Hyperloop. Uh, stations are very similar. So you, if you have a passenger station, you, you, you will need to have the station managed. You will need to have the station with catering. You will need to have the station with restaurants. That is very similar. So you can assume it will be the same. And operation, um, I think it will be similar, but perhaps a little bit less uh, required uh, because again, the, the level of automation of Hyperloop will be higher than existing currently for rail. Excellent. A couple of questions. Uh, what differentiates Hyperloop from different companies such as Elon Musk's boring company? So thank you. That, that's an excellent question. So Elon Musk uh, played an interesting role in Hyperloop. He, he was kind of the original, he, he wrote the white paper and he, um, he launched the, the Hyperloop as an initiative, but he has not really himself invested into it. He has this boring company that is boring tunnels. And they have bored a tunnel under Los Angeles. I think they're doing something in Las, Las Vegas. So what is not, at least the, the, the tunnel that does exist under Los Angeles, it doesn't seem to be actively used, but it's more made for passenger cars to drive under LA. So I think the concept is somewhat different uh, in, in the sense that Hyperloop if you look at all the Hyperloop companies, they assume a certain regular service using Hyperloop. They assume a low pressure environment uh, and they assume that each um, what's called a, a pod, which is the, the car for the Hyperloop will travel independently. Uh, it, they, they do not assume that you will be able to drive it with your own car. Uh, it, there will be specially kind of designed uh, vehicles for that. So I, I think, the, the Elon Musk has played an incredible role in kickstarting the whole Hyperloop movement. Uh, but yes, he, he is developing the, the boring company alongside some of his other um, interests like Tesla and like SpaceX. So uh, we don't necessarily see it as a competitor, but it could overlap. That's also possible. Okay, another question. What is the energy cost for building and maintaining the structure? How feasible is renewable energy in the context of Kuwait? Uh, if I start with the latter part of the question, so in terms of Kuwait, uh, the energy use of Hyperloop is approximately four times less than uh, high-speed rail and 10 times less than travel. Now, in the context of Kuwait, that means the Hyperloop can be battered by solar power. Um, and for, again, for Kuwait, th there could be two different angles. One is focused on cargo movement uh, and the other focused on passenger. Now, passenger, it would mean linking Kuwait with, for example, Saudi Arabia. Uh, whereas cargo, could be made to link with some of the ports of entry in Kuwait. It could be made to link with the sort of new uh, Kuwait city uh, developments and the, well, the Silk City developments uh, in order to supply uh, perishable goods. And this is actually quite a relevant item, perishable goods while not clogging up the motorways, because this is a problem in, in, that exists in Kuwait uh, when you have trucks that obviously occupy space. And in fact, if you build a Hyperloop, you can remove uh, a large, well, a large part of those trucks, especially transporting um, either high, high value items or items uh, that are relatively compact. So even including water bottles, vegetables, um, clothing. Excellent. So last question, uh, referring back to the initial slide with regards to uh, a couple of companies that have uh, proprietary technology, uh, is Hyperloop a um, open source kind of technology whereby different companies can integrate in a region or uh, it's, it's one company takes all pretty much and then you're stuck with that? 
So I think that's an excellent question, and maybe I'll 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 answer I'll answer it in this way. I think the the answer hasn't yet been given, um, and because it's not a purely technology based answer. So let, let me try to explain that the the original so the, the three core parts of Hyperloop pipeline construction, magnetic levitation, low pressure environment are are open source, um, but making it all work together actually is a lot of work and does it require a lot of technical know-how and ip uh, development now because each company is going along its own path this interchangeability will become an issue and this is why standards are important the standards effort will be is, is focused on creating a certain unified standard which will force companies to actually share their IP as a form of licensing. Now, this is the technology angle. There is a commercial angle. And the commercial angle is, well, who is there one party that can completely dominate this picture? And what will it take? And I would say, okay, that there are six companies, three of them in Europe, two in the US, one in Canada, that are developing Hyperloop. Um, it is unlikely that one company will have all the market and it's actually not, not a good idea. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying it's unlikely is not even an issue of funding, it is an issue of public, uh, is, is an issue of government. Because if there's only one reliable supplier of a technology, then you have a monopoly. And then any government will, will have a risk that it develop it, it it is involved in an infrastructure development that is relying on whether one company succeeds or fails. And that is not a very good way for governments to invest in infrastructure. Uh, a second element is, will it be a purely government funded project, project or PPP? And I believe it will be PPP. It will involve private investment. And therefore, the private parties, the private infrastructure funds, the, the government funds will need to make sure there is a, a long-term framework. So it, it's a kind of long answer, but I would say at this stage, I would think there will be a number of companies still in existence developing Hyperloop in a few years. Uh, whether it's six or a smaller number, it remains to be seen. But I think it's very important to have at least two or three credible parties developing Hyperloop for a, a public body to take a risk on, 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 uh, on commissioning or getting involved in a Hyperloop project. Excellent. Thank you, Constantin. Really appreciate it. We'll close and wrap up the Q&A. Uh, thank you for being our guest tonight. Thanks to our audiences for attending the last lecture for 2020. We look forward to seeing everyone in our upcoming lectures early January in 2021. Hopefully everyone be healthy and in good shape. Constantin, thank you again for your presentation and we look forward to seeing you real soon in Kuwait. Thank you everyone and good night. Thank you, bye-bye.